by Max Chris Morgan Factory. This week's video, what a ripper. Uh, it's two parts. So the first part, we found out a bit more information on the Grand Prix Triumph. So a few weeks ago, I was on the phone, on Facebook, and I found a photo of Ray Owen, and next to Ray Owen, there was a photo of Dave Powell sitting on a Grand Prix Triumph. It's not unusual to see photos of Grand Prix Triumphs, but this one was in Tassie and that's where our bike come from and dave was from hobart and that's where the bike was delivered so if you want to know a bit more about this you better watch the video that's in the first half now the second half is just an update on where we're at and it's coming up fantastic now i'd like to thank everybody for getting in touch with us and donating a few parts to the bike um we've got a new exhaust system coming and all that i can't remember all the names i'll get them on the next video and to thank everyone i really appreciate it and uh, let's have a look at the video. They're sleeping bags in the door, ways of clothes, dollar stores, humming pink neon signs, plastic diamonds for mine. So this bike was delivered to Tasmania mm -hmm. uh, in September. September. 1949 and possibly we've got a little bit of a chance here but we might have found out a bit more history about it yeah we might have found out who actually uh, who actually owned it uh, over there there was a guy over there called dave powell who was extremely well known road racer motocrosser trials rider and eventually road outfits yeah road outfits set land speed records he held a few australian land speed records on nortons and things and uh, he eventually got into car racing and uh, his family have got a, a, an excellent collection of memorabilia and um, they've been very kind to uh, send me a lot of it on the phone which has been good it's been a great read really. actually yeah. a lot of newspaper cuttings so still not 100 percent sure yet but we're working our way through it yeah. and the timeline does sort of work out though doesn't it, it does the timeline works out because he took a new uh, oh, this, this one arrived in Hobart in September 1949 and then in October, early November, he took his new Grand Prix Triumph to South Australia to race. And what else did he take? He, he took a 350 Manx Norton, which was the very first double overhead cam Manx Norton to come to Australia. Yeah, so he, he must have been pretty good. He was good. He was good. Yeah. I, look, I, I hadn't heard much about him at all, but I've studied up his record and yeah, he was good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a picture of him on his Grand Prix Triumph um, on the podium with um, Murray Quincy. Uh, he came second to Murray Quincy, so he must have been pretty good. Yeah, and there's one um, with him with Ray Owen. Yeah, Ray Owen. Yeah, well, see, they were all top riders in their day. Yeah. I was fortunate enough that I actually knew Ray Owen. I met Ray Owen on many occasions. And... Uh, so yeah. this could be a good story. We'll keep at it until we get to the end. Yeah, we'll see so how we go. Yeah. At this stage, we've got a 25% chance because there were, apparently there might have been four delivered to Tassie between 47 and 50. Yeah. So we've just got to work our way through it and see what we can work This out. one is very close, though, to the one that he took to South Australia. Yes, it is. It's yeah. only months away. Weeks. It's only really weeks difference, yeah, it really. So, it's only a matter of weeks. So yeah. this, this could be it. How it finished up in Eagle Hawk... Just out of Bendigo it was just a, an absolute mystery, um, but it was there. I knew the bike was there uh, like 53 years ago, mm -hmm. and um, when I was 20, so I'm giving my age away now. But um, I know that Jerry Clark had this bike in the 60s, early 60s. He raced it at Fisherman's Bend. We've actually got a photo of him riding it yep. at Fisherman's Bend, and uh, I don't know how long he had it before that. Well, and it being crashed. Oh, yes. And yeah. I was just wondering whether, when he came over to South Australia, mm. how, mm. whether it was crashed there. And he left it. And he got out of it. Yeah, sold, left it, it sold, it, sold it on. Yeah. There I, I and then, know. just got yeah. out of it. Yeah. So bring it home. Well, he was still actually riding a Grand Prix Triumph in 1950. Yes. It's it's in, that, in those newspaper articles. He was still riding a Grand Prix Triumph in 1950. So... That puts about a 10 year history gap, 10 or 12 years. Just, we'll just say Jerry got it in early 1960. Uh, so there's 10 or 12 years gap there. Yeah. We don't know, like, 
Who knows? It might have been advertised, and Jerry might have bought it straight from him. Who knows? Yeah, we don't know. You, you wouldn't know. But uh, well, we'll, we'll endeavour to. Yeah, we'll do our best, best, won't we? Yeah, we'll do our best to find out the history of it because I'm just as interested in the history of it as I am the bike. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, the guy who's grandfather owned it he's a very approachable sort of guy he's only a young bloke too yeah he is he's 30, 38 or something and he's right into it yeah he, he's really pleased that uh, we've got the bike i've sent him some photos and he's responded to that and uh if i'm lucky enough to get back over to tassie in the next year or two i'm popping and see if i can have a chat to him yeah be, be excellent yeah it would be Actually, me and you could fly over there to see him. Well, we could. If it if it works out... We could fly to Hobart. He's in Hobart, so we could fly to Hobart. If it works out that it is the bike, mm. I think we will fly over and we'll do a really good story. Invisible passers-by They just turn a blind eye Turn me out and let me lie On the pavement tonight Soaked in rain, cloaked in lies we're the same, don't know why I'm invisible to their eyes A fair bit of progress, do you want to tell us where you're up to? Right, eh? I've been concentrating on this area and uh, I've made these two mudguard stays and that one's flat so that it goes under the seat and um, it's got two small bolts through it yep. um, it's it's clamped at the bottom of the f down here and the bottom of the frame it's also clamped up there yeah and it's got that double clamp on the back yeah right and it's really solid now the seats do sometimes sit up on little spaces and i've got to make some little spaces to sit the seat so yeah, it sits so just right there it's a tubing at the moment just hold yeah up. just a bit of a um a bit of an experimental thing to see yep. how it's going to sit Check the height and all that yep. yeah but it's going to sit good mud guards pretty much in the middle which is not too bad for me actually to do something like that. yeah 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 yep, yep. and uh i've been working on the back brake um i've made up some bits and pieces for the back brake and i'm pretty happy with that um, the linkage was missing from the brake arm to the frame um, and I wasn't quite sure exactly what it looked like so um, a guy in Castle Main has got a sprung hub uh, Triumph and uh, he asked me to come down and have a look at it which I did and I worked out what's required for that which I've made that up there it's just a link and a bush um, and that bolt is stepped so that when you tighten the nut up that can still rotate in there a bit. Yeah, it still moves, yeah. It still moves, yeah. So I've done that and uh, I've made up the bracket for the remote flat bowl. Yep, she looks good. Yep, and uh, the tickler was missing, so I had to make a little tickler for it. I did that and uh, we've just actually just set the uh, ignition timing, um, which will be about 37, 38 degrees before top dead centre on full advance. Tearing uh. cities on our pipes Don't go walking after that Now, with these, with triumphs, uh, I don't know much about anything else, but with triumphs, you just time it up as normal, and then if, when you go to start, if it won't go, you just swap the spark plug going <laughs> over. Words, yeah. Because it's it's pretty difficult to tell which so plug you're actually timing it, timing it on. Yeah. So if it won't go, swap the loads over and they'll go. Give her a go. Yeah, that, that'll happen. So um, I've struck that a few times before. When my uh, friend, the late Joe Poning, and I were racing and tinkering around with a race kit at Tiger 100 back in the 70s, um, that's what we used to do. We'd time it up. If it wouldn't go, swap the plug loads over and off she'd go. Nice. Now, yeah. Will Bees, he's done a bit of a job for you as well. He has. He's uh, tidied up the petrol tank. It looks fantastic. It had some it's awesome, a massive petrol tank. It is. It had some really um, ugly dents in it. It's still got a couple of little ones that he couldn't get out. But uh, he's done a top job, as always, of tidying it up. And this filler spout... It actually had a hit on the top and it was sort of recessed into the tank. So Will got a little slide hammer and pulled it all out oh, and right. redid the, the bronze weld on it. Yeah, he does a beautiful job, doesn't he? Yeah, a beautiful job. Yeah. He's done that. 
It's got the four little holes in the top for the little uh, loops to put the uh, the chin rest or the chest rest on. Yeah. Which I'll get made. I'll get one of those made up for it. Um, the clutch is finished uh, and working. You might be able to see it. Might be able to see it expanding. Since there's a snake that I like a shark. Bloody hands, frail bones, hunched and aching, still they're gone, but they don't know where they're going. Yeah, my mate Ken Smith donated this little seat to the cause, and it's got a British name on the back of it. Yep. And uh, another friend of mine donated me a front mudguard, uh, Castle Maine, Peter Gregory, well-named motorbike man in Castle Maine. Yep. He donated me the front mudguard to the cause. So um, people are taking interest in it. Yeah, that's no, fantastic. Yeah, a lot of people are taking interest in it. Um, yeah, it's going to be a, a pretty rare machine. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing Chris roar down the straight at Broadford on it, actually. Yeah, I'll have a go. Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, maybe run it at um, Tarangower. Yeah. Mount Tarangower Hill Climb, Eddington Sprints. Eddington Sprints, well... Yep. We'll get it out there so people can see it. We will. We need well, to get it out. And yep. it's, it was hidden away in Bendigo for a long time. Yeah, for 50, 53 years, actually. Yep. And a lot of people know about it, but a lot of people have never seen it. Well, actually, I was talking to a, a, a well-known Bendigo motorcyclist the other day and a, pretty much a lifetime friend of mine, Bob Andrews. And Bob said, that bike was a bit of a legend, you know. Nobody really knew whether it existed or not. Yeah. Um, but he, he said, uh, I'm glad that you've got it. He said, at least there's something happening with it. So Yeah, and it's good that it's going to stay in town. And It'll stay in Bendigo. And the family will get to see it. We'll, the family will we'll get, get to together it. somewhere. We'll fire it up. and We will. Yeah. We will. And we'll have a little bit of a little bit of a party. Yeah, we'll, right we'll, we'll have a start-up party. So, yeah, yeah it should be good. Um, the, the tank, you're back to the tank. Yes. Those are unique to, the, to a Grand Prix Triumph. They're not, not the same as any other Triumph tank. All the other Triumph tanks have got a, a like a knee dent in the yes. side there. That sort of curves in at the side. But they made these straight at the sides on the hope of uh, they might hold a couple of litres more fuel uh, to get around the Isle of Man. And I think they must have been pretty successful because they won the Isle of Man in 1946 and 48. Yeah, and it has the cutout in front of the seat too, doesn't it? Yep. Which you don't normally see either, do yeah, you? Yeah, no. Not so much like that, no. no. And... Um, they did win a few other significant races. They won the amateur Daytona, um, 200 mile race, and uh, lots of races, a um, lot, lot of domestic races, and uh, a lot of European championship races they were involved in and won a few. And they were known to be a little bit fragile, but uh, I suppose when you uh, build a race bike, a proper pucker race bike from a roadster, that's, that's sort of what you get, you know? Exactly, yeah. Um, you know, it's not like a G50 or a Manx or something that, you know, a Manx Norton would do a couple of seasons of hard racing. Yeah. Uh, and they wouldn't falter, but, you know, these were a bit fragile. But um, when you've got a long stroke 500 like this that puts out 42, 43 horsepower on low-grade petrol, it... It's got a bit of performance. Yeah, I think on the donation it said 43 on methanol. Yeah, and 40, uh, 47 on oh, methanol. Oh, 47 was it? 47 on methanol. Right, hey, so if you've been following um, Triumph Build, you know it's coming along great. Um, we'll have more information coming from Tassie sooner or later. Uh, we'll keep at it. I think I might have found the shop where the bike was actually delivered to, which might have been King's. So we'll find that out. I think it might be John King. And I think his brother was Sim. He had the Harley dealership and all that. But I think John had the Triumph dealership and Valisets and all that. But uh, we'll work that out. But if you like what you see, like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell everybody. Let's bring Hagen.